Starting off this countdown, we have Prabhu Batara. Prabhu Batara was a taxi driver in India that got mauled to death by a bear after trying to take a selfie with it. He was driving some passengers home from a wedding when he spotted a bear by the side of the road. He got out, leaving the passengers in the car, promising he would only be a few minutes. The bear was injured and trying to drink water from a pond. When he got too close to it, the bear attacked. He got pulled to the ground and clawed at. The photos you see here are photos people took of the incident as it happened. Now people did go to his rescue but were afraid for their own life. So they tried to scare off the bear by throwing rocks and sticks at it. But in the end, this enraged the bear even more. He passed away minutes after these photos were taken. Moving on to number 9, we have David Johnston. David Johnston was a 31 year old volcanoologist that fell victim to a volcano explosion on May 18th, 1980. 13 hours before his death, this photo was taken of him. That was the very spot that he was killed. So on that day, it was Johnston's shift to keep an eye on Mount St. Helen, the mountain where the explosion occurred. He was six miles away from the volcano. That morning, the eruption came fast and without warning. As it was erupting, he signaled to the base saying, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it. Shortly after he radioed that, he was killed by a lateral blast from the volcano. Sadly, his body was never found. All that was left were remnants of his trailer. Now, it breaks my heart seeing that photo. Just look how happy he looks. Little did he know that 13 hours later, that would be it. And at number 8 we have the dangerous selfie. Taking selfies any and everywhere is kind of the new norm, but you would never think that a selfie would be deadly. Sadly, you'd be mistaken. Back in March of 2017, best friends Nidzia Mendoza Corral and Clarissa Morquicho Miranda were taking selfies on an airstrip when they were hit and killed by an oncoming plane. The two were standing in the back of a van when this happened, but they were warned not to do so. They took this photo and moments later they were hit by a wing of a plane that they didn't see coming. They passed away instantly. Now when you look at this photo, it just feels so dark knowing seconds later the girls lost their lives. Coming in at number 7 we have the extreme selfie. 26 year old Wu Yongning was known for his extreme selfies. He was considered a rooftopper which means he would stand on high buildings or structures or other precarious places and take photos and videos doing so. He made a living doing this and he would do so with no harness, net or safety equipment. This photo was one of the last photos he ever took. That was before November of 2017 when he died after falling off of a 62 story building. He was doing this as part of a contest to win 100,000 yuans, but this would be the last of his dangerous stunts. He climbed up to the top of that building that day with the hopes of winning that prize. He never thought it would end the way that it did. Coming in at number 6 we have Gary Slock. This selfie is of Gary Slock and his mother aboard their flight. Little did they know the horrors that would soon await. They were both excited for their vacation to Malaysia. The trip was designed for single parents and their children. Sadly, three hours after that photo was taken, a missile shot down the plane as it flew over eastern Ukraine. There were no survivors. The two were so excited for their trip. They referred to it as their dream holiday. Again, just look how happy the two were. This breaks my heart. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the deadly Tinder date. A lot of people use the dating app Tinder, but there have been a number of Tinder horror stories of dates going terribly wrong, including this one. This is Cindy Loof. This is also the last photo of Cindy. Cindy was very excited to meet up with her Tinder date, Audrey, but Audrey wasn't who she said she was. She was actually a girl named Bailey Boswell. The two had already gone out the night before on November 14th, 2017. On that day, she sent a message to Bailey asking if it was only going to be the two of them. Previously, she had gone on dates with other women who would try to bring a male along for some extra fun, but Bailey reassured her it was only going to be them. On November 15th, on their second date, Bailey brought her boyfriend along. Bailey then convinced Sydney to participate in some acts with the two. This led to them playing a game in which Sydney was choked to death. So the last photo of Sydney was her all excited for her date. 
which would later take her life. In our fourth spot, we have Anne Faber. On the evening of September 29th, 2017, Anne Faber went out for a bike ride by herself. By 6.50 p.m., she got caught in the rain and sent this selfie to her boyfriend. An hour later, her boyfriend reached out to her, but by then, it was too late. Anne had already been kidnapped. Her body was found two weeks later in the woods. That was the last photo Anne ever took, and also the last photo of her. Moving on, number three, we have the stowaway. At 14 years of age, Keith Sapsford was sent to a Catholic residential school. He hated it so much that he fled, heading to the Sydney airport with hopes of stowing away on an airplane, headed to Japan. But his plan took a deadly turn. On February 22nd of 1970, he snuck into the airport and climbed into the airplane's wheel compartment. He waited there safely for the plane to take off. Sadly, when the plane was 200 feet in the air, the plane wheels retracted and he fell 200 feet to his death. At this time, a photographer named John Gilpin was taking pictures at the airport when he saw the boy falling from the sky. He managed to capture this photo. That was the last photo ever taken of Keith. Literally, you see him falling from the sky, it's creepy. In our second spot, we have Japan Airlines Flight 123. This photo was recovered from Japan Airlines Flight 123, the flight that ended up in disaster with the plane crashing and 520 people dying. This incident is said to be one of the deadliest single plane crashes in the history. Only four passengers survived. On August 12th, 1985, the plane took off at 6.12 p.m. and was scheduled to arrive at Osaka one hour later. But during the flight, the pilot had trouble controlling the plane, and they began to lose altitude quickly. This photo was taken as that was happening. You can see the oxygen masks drop down as a result. After failing to gain control of the plane, it crashed into Mount Takamagahara. This is the last photo of almost everyone on board. And in our number one spot, we have Regina K. Walters. Back in 1991, Regina K. Walters and her boyfriend ran off together. Later, they were picked up by a man named Robert Ben Rhodes. He was known as the truck stop killer. He was a serial killer that murdered over 50 women. Regina K. Walters was his last victim. This photo is of Regina after being abducted by Robert. He forced her to cut her hair and made her wear that dress and the heels you see in the photo. He then proceeded to take a number of photos of her, including this one in which she looks terrified for her own life. These photos were taken in an abandoned farmhouse where her body was later found. So the last photos of Regina were taken by her killer in the place she died. What gets me the most is the look in her eyes. She looks terrified, as anyone would be in her situation. At number 10, parkour gone wrong. I'm sure you've all seen an example of parkour before, but I would personally describe it as people launching themselves from one spot to the next, avoiding injury by the skin of their teeth. Often done outdoors, some of the maneuvers these people do are seemingly impossible. While it takes a lot of practice and coordination, this sport can also be super dangerous. Parkour daredevils like to take things quite literally to the next level, and as heights get higher and tricks get more technical, disaster is not far behind. Pavel Kashin was a Russian parkour artist who unfortunately learned his lesson the hard way. In 2013, he was performing a stunt on the rooftop of a 16 story building with a friend filming. They ended up capturing the final moments of Kashin. Life. He was one of the well known parkour artists or free runners, being named one of the best in the world. He was known for his breakthrough stunts, which you can still find videos of today. On the day of his passing, Sheen was standing on a three foot wide ledge on the top of an apartment building. The daredevil decided to do a backflip on this very small ledge, with him completing the trick only to lose his footing on the landing and be sent over the edge. Kashin's fans and fellow members of the parkour community showed their support and sent respects to his family. His friends uploaded the final image of Pavel mid-flip with the permission of his parents to the web. Kashin's parents hoped that the image would deter others from doing the same as their son. Number 9. Wind Turbine Fire If you have ever seen a wind turbine in real life before, you will know just how massive the energy converting monsters actually are. In October 2013, two workers were doing routine maintenance to a 67 meter high turbine in Oltensplat, Netherlands. 
don't come for me, I know I butchered that name, but while they were doing this maintenance, a fire broke out quickly engulfing the only escape route, trapping the workers high above the ground. Due to the height of the fire, the firefighters had a hard time reaching the fire to put it out, so a specialized crew of firefighters were called in with a large crane. Unfortunately, this took hours, which the technicians did not have. In their last moments, a photo of the tragedy was snapped, and in it you can see the turbine in a blaze, but you can also see the two workers embracing in their final moments. The image just amplifies how big the turbine actually is and shows how hopeless a rescue mission would have been. The men were just 19 and 21 at the time. One tried one last effort to survive, with one man jumping from the wind turbine in the last effort to save himself, and the other tried to scale down the side, only to be caught up in the blaze. The man who jumped was found in a field next to the turbine, and the other was found when firefighters were able to finally climb to the turbine. The cause of the fire is unknown, but believed to be a short circuit. While this freak accident ended up taking two lives, the tragedy led to a political inquiry into safety precautions for wind turbine maintenance crews. Their final photo together was sad, but it was nice that in their final moments they did have each other. Number 8. Racing to Disaster Gary Box was one of the many firefighters who was there on 9-11 risking it all in order to save lives. Unfortunately, he was also one of the many who never made it home after that day. Hours before heroically losing his life, Box was photographed racing towards the disaster. The image was taken in the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel by a pedestrian in their car. Their engine got stuck in the traffic of the tunnel, so in full gear carrying as much as they could, Box and the rest of his crew started running on foot to ground zero. Gary was 35 at the time and his remains were never recovered. All images taken that day I'm sure have something haunting about them, but knowing how little time he had left is another level. At number 7, Rinaldo Dexa. He was a Filipino politician, a member of the peacekeeping action team, and a corporal in the Philippine Army Reserve Command. Now this photo is not of Dagsa before he passed, but due to how haunting it is, I still had to include it. His passing achieved notoriety due to the picture he snapped of his family on New Year's with unbelievable timing. The image Dagsa captured also inadvertently captured the man who was about to take the shot that would ultimately take his life. The photo was extremely helpful when it came to investigators identifying the shooter because the image shows the gunman quite literally seconds before taking the fatal shot. The picture was taken outside the councilman's house in Metropolitan Manila. The photo led to a quick arrest of the shooter as well as his accomplice. Apparently the suspects were known car thieves out on bail, likely holding a grudge against Dexa who had the men arrested a year earlier. It is extremely sad that Dexa unknowingly captured his own final moments, especially with his family being right there, but at least they were able to use it to catch the gunman. Number 6. Discount Flight Keith Sapsard was from Randwick, New South Wales. He passed away just 14 years old with his final moments caught on camera. On February 22, 1970, the teen snuck onto the tarmac at Sydney Airport in Australia with the idea to hide inside a Tokyo-bound plane in order to run away. Unfortunately, Sapsford would never make it to Tokyo. His father described Keith as a curious kid who always had an urge to keep on the move. Due to his restlessness, his parents decided to send him to Boys Town, a Roman Catholic institution specializing in troubled children, for some discipline and structure. Instead, Sapsford escaped from the facility after a couple weeks and headed to the airport. Thanks to the far more relaxed regulations and security of the 70s, Sapsford was able to sneak onto the tarmac with ease. It's unknown if Keith knew where the plane was headed, but he saw a plane preparing for boarding and climbed into its wheel well. It took a few hours for the plane to take off, but eventually it made its way to the sky. What Keith didn't know was that the plane was going to reopen the wheel compartments to retract the wheels. When this happened, and Sapsford fell out of the plane, falling 200 feet. One of the craziest things about this tragic event was by pure coincidence. Photographer John Gilpin was simply taking pictures at the airport when he unknowingly snapped a pic at the exact same time Sapsford was falling from the plane. I bet when he developed that roll of film, he was totally surprised. His father later said, All my son wanted to do was see the world. He had itchy feet, and his determination to see how the rest of the world lives cost him his life. Obviously, what happened to Keith was a tragedy, but the photo captured by Gilpin is remarkable as well as haunting. At number 5, Fatal Friend Brittany Gargle and Cheyenne Antoine were the best of friends until they weren't. Apparently Brittany was extremely hard working, at 16 she was juggling school and two jobs. Antoine had a rough upbringing with her parents falling into substance use, Cheyenne grew up in foster care. At 15, Antoine's mother passed away and to cope with the news she got involved with some dangerous company also falling into substance use. That's when the two girls met and Brittany helped Cheyenne manage her feelings and the two became close. On March 25th, 
7th, 2015, Britney posted a picture of her and Cheyenne on social media. The two planned to go out for drinks and have fun, but as the night went on, things got out of hand and the details became fuzzy. The girls traveled to a pub, then to a house party, and then one more pub. Cheyenne claimed that around 4 a.m., Britney asked a man for a lighter and invited him for drinks, but she didn't know what happened later. Cheyenne heard nothing from Britney the next day, and later the police received a 911 call of a woman lying on her back, cold to the touch. The woman was identified as Britney. Cheyenne was questioned and her story checked out, but the police thought she was hiding something. As the police dug further, more details came out. In the end, Britney's passing was ruled a strangling, and this led to oh my god, and this led them to a crucial lead. It was the picture Cheyenne had posted on social media the night of the events. In it, Cheyenne was wearing a stylish black belt, the same belt that had been found at the crime scene. In 2017, after all the evidence collected, Cheyenne was arrested for taking Britney's life, with Cheyenne claiming not to remember anything due to the substances. In the end, Cheyenne was sentenced to seven years in prison with her release in 2024. At number four, the final dive. Nicholas Mavoli was an American free diver who passed doing what he loved, but not before taking a picture that will give you the chills. Mavoli began free diving competitively in 2012, winning titles twice at the Deja Blue competition and finishing third at the Caribbean Cup in Honduras. With much success in his newfound passion, Mavoli only wanted to take things even further. On November 15, 2013, he prepared to dive into Dean's Blue Hole, hoping to reach 72 meters on a single inhalation with no fins or supplemental oxygen. Surrounded by 15 other athletes and observers, as well as five safety divers, he submerged face first, looking like a human arrow diving into the darkness that would ultimately end up being his last dive. Mike Board, free diving record holder, said diving into a depth with no fins, that's a hard physical dive. I was thinking, okay, he's going to have a hard time getting up. Yet, after a dive of 3 minutes and 38 seconds, Mavoli shot back up to the surface. Unfortunately, instead of celebrating the dive, things quickly turned into a nightmare. Mavoli ripped off his goggles, flashed the OK sign, and attempted to complete surface protocol that would make the attempt official by saying, I am OK. But he wasn't. His words came out jumbled and his eyes were wide and blank. This moment was captured on camera and the blank fear in the diver's eyes is frightening. He lost consciousness and never regained it after suffering a pulmonary edema. Number 3. Dytlov Pass Mystery The Dytlov Pass incident was the event in which nine Soviet trekkers passed away in the northern Ural Mountains between February 1st and 2nd, 1959, in uncertain circumstances. There are many theories as to what caused the tragedy, but ultimately, it's a mystery. The experienced trekking group from the Yuri Polytechnic Institute was led by Igor Dytlov. Overnight, something seemingly caused the group to cut their way out of their tent from inside and flee the campsite. While them cutting open the their tent from the inside is confusing enough, the bodies found were improperly dressed for the heavy snowfall and the freezing temperatures. As the story goes on, things only get further from making sense. After the bodies were discovered, Soviet authorities determined that six had passed from hypothermia, while the other three suffered physical trauma. One had major skull damage, two severe chest trauma, and another had a small skull fracture. Four of the bodies were found lying in a creek, and three of those bodies had soft tissue damage to the head and face. Two bodies were missing missing eyes, one missing a tongue, and another had missing eyebrows. Now, if it had just been the hypothermia, this case would be totally different. But what the heck did all this physical damage in the middle of nowhere? While we aren't sure exactly what went down, there are lots of pictures of the group's final days as well as plenty of theories. There was a new investigation opened in 2019 calling it an avalanche, but I don't know still. Does an avalanche really remove your tongue and eyeballs? Number 2. A Miracle of the Andes On October 13, 1972, Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571, chartered by an amateur rugby team, crashed into the Andes Mountains. The wreckage of the crash was not located for more than two months. There were only 16 out of 45 who survived the whole thing, with the incident gaining international attention after it was revealed the survivors had resorted to cannibalism. Due to the bad weather, the pilot of the plane misjudged their location, and the plane ended up striking a mountain, losing both wings before crashing into a remote valley of Argentina near the Chilean border. A search party was sent out, but due to the white plane on the white snow, it was unable to be spotted from above. After eight days, the search was called off, thinking there were no survivors, though later rescue efforts were taken over by family. 
There were initially 33 survivors, but due to the elements, injuries, and an avalanche, the numbers were shrinking. Several survivors surveyed the area for an escape route. On December 12th, almost exactly two months since the crash, three men set out to go find help. Though one did return to the crash site after a difficult trek, the other two men finally came across some people. It was December 20th now, and the people they found alerted the authorities. On December 22nd, six survivors were flown to safety, but bad weather meant the remaining eight waited until the 23rd. There are photos from both before the crash of the group. There are photos from both before the crash of the group on the plane and after of the group surrounding the fallen plane, as well as books and a movie about the incident. And at number one, a solo hike. In 2014, two women, Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon, were visiting Panama from the Netherlands, and on April 1st, they went on a walk through the scenic forest near the Baru volcano, only to never return. Alarm was raised the day after they didn't return from their hike, and a search party was sent out right away, only to find no sign of Kremers or Froon. A while later, a local woman found Froon's backpack. In the bag, they found her camera, two pairs of sunglasses, some cash, her passport, a water bottle, two bras, and both the women's phones. Probably the most concerning they found were the final images taken on the camera. All of the photos from April 1st are just the two women exploring the jungle. Then there are no pictures until April 8th, when 90 unsettling pictures were taken with the flash in the middle of the jungle time stamp between 1 and 4 a.m. Most of these images are of complete darkness and the jungle floor, but there are two very alarming pics. One shows some of the women's belongings on a rock, and the other looks like the back of Kremer's head with what appears to be bloodstain in her hair. Something else suspicious about the camera is that image 509 was missing, with 508 being the last of them looking okay, and image 510 being the first in the darkness days later. They found a pelvic bone and a foot still inside a boot. Froon's bones appeared to decompose naturally, but Kremer seemed to be stark white as if they'd been bleached, further leading to question if someone else was involved. In our number 10 spot. At first, this photo just looks like a silly good time between two boys, but what happens next is when it gets kind of crazy. The two in the photo are brothers, Michael and Sean McQuilkin, and it is from August 20th, 1975, when they were at Morro Rock in Sequoia National Park in California. The photo was taken by their sister Mary after they all thought that their hair standing up was absolutely hilarious and decided to snap a few photos to remember the moment. Well, they surely will never forget it because just a few moments after this photo was taken, they were actually struck by lightning. One of the brothers said that he raised his hand into the air and that the ring he had on was buzzing, and then suddenly they were all on the ground and smoke was pouring out of Sean's back. The good news is that they all survived the lightning that day, but I bet it certainly wasn't the day that they had planned. In our number 9 spot, this photo was taken by David Seymour in 1948. This photo was taken in Warsaw, and the child in the photo is named Terezka, who was in a home for emotionally disturbed children after being raised in a concentration camp. The drawing on the blackboard is what she drew when the children were asked to draw home. While it is obviously common for children to have indistinguishable drawings, her backstory and the look in her eyes really tell a story. I hope she was able to grow and overcome some of the horrible things that she had been put through. I really wish I could know exactly what she was trying to draw and depict. In our number 8 spot, this is a photo from 1991 and is of Rajiv Gandhi who is the 6th Prime Minister of India. He took office after his mother had been assassinated and was the youngest Prime Minister at only 40 years old. This photo was taken by a 21 year old local photographer named Haribabu, but little did everyone know, this would be the last photo he took and the last photo ever taken of Rajiv. Moments after this photo was taken, the woman in the bottom left corner with the orange flowers in her hair approached Rajiv and when she she bent down to touch his feet, she detonated a belt of explosives that she had on under her dress. This explosion ended up killing them all and around 13 other people. Haribabu's camera ended up staying intact throughout the blast and this is how we were able to retrieve this photo. Coming in at number 7. This photo carries quite the backstory. This photo is of Violet Spears who was born in Elgin, Scotland in 1839. She was married at 15 and by the time she was 22 she had 4 children. At 33, her husband ended up passing away due to a hunting accident and Violet then packed up her and the kids and went to her sisters where they all remained for 2 years. 
After these two years, Violet just disappeared from her sisters, leaving all of her children behind. No one heard from her for a year after she left, but money began to be sent to them monthly. In 1876, a medium and hypnotist named Madame Violet began to gain popularity in Edinburgh. She had a small following at the time that she called her hive. Slowly her seances began to get more elaborate and outrageous, and she slowly began to ask clients to donate small bits of blood, saying that it helped her connect to the spirits. She would actually drink the blood given to her, and she has been quoted saying that this element returned to me had been missing my whole life. Eventually her hive grew and they all ended up living together and would only come out at night. They would attract and convince men and women, usually with the help of drugs and alcohol, to donate a bit of blood and most often would convince these people to leave their lives to come and join the hive. The hive continued to grow for the coming decade, but when the son of a prominent councilman joined the hive and ended up developing an infection from the bloodletting and actually died, the hive was condemned and they ended up being disbanded. Madame Violet ended up living until 1930, where she died at the age of 90. In our number six spot, this photo comes from what is left of the Eastern State Penitentiary in Pennsylvania. This prison used to be the most famous and the most expensive in the world, but now this is the sort of thing that is left of it. This prison is actually now used as a tourist attraction, and it becomes a haunted house during Halloween. The prison used to house some pretty high profile prisoners, such as Scarface himself, Al Capone. The prison was opened in 1829 and was known for its advanced technology for the time. Things like central heating, flush toilets, and shower baths in each cell. These were all considered luxuries in 1829. The first prisoner to be held there was Charles Williams, who was facing a two-year sentence for theft. When he arrived at the prison, he had a hood over his head so as to protect his identity, but also so that he wouldn't know what the rest of the prison looked like, so he would be unable to plan an escape. While prison is never good, the craziest thing about this specific one is that all the prisoners lived in isolation. I can't even imagine what that would be like, especially for the people who found themselves in there for long periods of time. Number five. This photo is a series of self-portraits by the artist William Utter Molin. In 1995, William was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, which is an incredibly difficult thing to have to go through. William's self-portraits obviously reflect a lot of what was going on in his mind during some of the last years of his life. Part of what Alzheimer's does is that it affects the part of the brain that we use for visualizing things, which is part of the reasons why the paintings began to get so different from the original. This series of paintings is actually sometimes used as a study material for medical students because it does such a wonderful job at portraying something that a person without Alzheimer's wouldn't be able to understand. I think William left the world with something very sad, but also beautiful, poignant, and important. Number four. This photo comes from the 19th century from the third plague pandemic. This was the first time that the plague had spread to all five continents. While we now know something about what that might have been like, what we haven't had to endure are doctors that are dressed like this. This is a photo of the outfits and masks that plague doctors wore when they would come to your house to treat or diagnose you. The long beak-like noses of the masks are very creepy, but they were used to hold herbs and other nicely scented things because they believed that this would help ward off the bad air, which at the time is what they thought was causing the sickness. The COVID-19 pandemic has been bad enough, so I'm very glad that our doctors and nurses can stick to their scrubs and regular masks. There's something about these outfits that just make it seem like something bad is about to happen. Number three. This photo looks like a big lump of nothing, but it is called an elephant's foot. Don't worry, at first I was worried, but it has nothing to do with elephants and is only named that because of its appearance. This lump was actually created from the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown and is just a mass of corium and other materials that were in the core of the reactor. This elephant's foot was located in the steam distribution corridor, which is under what's left of the reactor. While this mass doesn't produce as much radiation as it did before, it does still produce a deadly amount but it is said that if you stood in front of it for just 300 seconds, that would be enough to get a lethal dose of radiation. It's kind of crazy that even though they knew this, they were still standing there taking pictures of it, but I'm glad because now we get to see it and it gives us just a little more insight into what happened that day. Number two. 
This photo is of a man named Chris McCandless, who may be better known as Alex Supertramp. Chris was a traveler who inspired the book and movie Into the Wild, which were created to follow the story of his life, and more specifically, his final great Alaskan adventure. This photo is unfortunately the last photo taken of Chris while he was on this Alaskan trip, and he ended up passing away in the wilderness. A lot of people have speculated that this photo was taken as his sort of goodbye. It is highly debated how he died, so there isn't quite a concrete answer of what exactly exactly happened to him. It is a very unfortunate end to such a young man's life, but he left quite a legacy. His story has inspired countless people and holds a special place in a lot of people's lives. He was a man who rejected conformity and materialism, and with his life and death he really left an important message for all of us to take a step back and remember what is really important. While the story has such a sad ending, there is also a lot of beautiful things that we can take from it. And in our number one spot today. This photo was taken by Fred Blackwell on May 28th, 1963, and is actually showing us a moment of protest. The three sitting at the counter are Joan Trumpor, Ann Moody, and their sociology teacher, John Salter. The reason why this photo is so important is because these three are sitting at a white-only counter at Woolworth's Five and Dime store in Jackson, Mississippi, while being assaulted by an angry mob. People are throwing condiments at them and I'm sure saying some pretty nasty things. Things. The two students went to Tougaloo College, which was a black college that ended up being at the core of the civil rights movement in Mississippi. It's amazing to see how brave they are, and a photo like this really is such an important message for us to remember today. Mm -hmm.